Um, good morning, everybody, and thanks, Mike, for the invitation to speak. I'm really glad to be here. And as Mike mentioned, uh, I went to NC State University, and I have to admit I was uh, intrigued by Bill's presentation this morning, if you're here for the first one. Uh, Gary Blanco was on my graduate committee, so I have to give him a hard time about that comment he made. And he will not be getting a Christmas card from me this year. So. <laughs> Maybe I'll send him a, a bundle of short leaf uh, seedlings in, in the mail as a, as a little Christmas gift just to, to, to rib him a little bit, but I couldn't resist. So, Anyway, I'm here to talk um, about something I guess a little bit different than what we've been talking about. I'm talk here to talk about funding, so uh, funding that's available for um, the restoration and management of short leaf pine, specifically here in the Cumberland Plateau. Uh, unfortunately, our programs don't extend quite out to the full range at this point, but hopefully this will be interesting to a lot of you just to see uh, how we're building this program and possibly opportunities for us to build new partnerships in the future and, and expand this work to other portions of the short leaf range. So before I get into the program, I just thought for those of you that aren't familiar with the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, just a little overview of who we are and what we do. Uh, we were chartered by Congress back in 1984. You may be familiar with some of the other foundations that were also uh, created by Congress. There's the National Forest Foundation and the National uh, Environmental Education Foundation. So we're kind of similar to them. Uh, we have a 30-member board that's appointed by uh, currently Secretary Jewell of the uh, Interior. Um, and really what we do is we're working to protect, restore, um, and enhance fish and wildlife habitat in, in, the, in the United States. And we do that by bringing together partners, uh, folks with, very, with com uh, complementary interests, both federal agencies, private sector, state, uh, local uh, resource agencies, and uh, really bringing resources to bear uh, to go out and actually help fund you know, the, the great work that you, folks like you are doing on the ground. And we do that by leveraging um, public funding with private money, and that's really the, the um, I guess, our bread and butter is bringing together uh, partnerships and, and building um, funding programs to help support on the ground conservation through grant making. And this is just another diagram kind of showing how we work, taking a little bit of federal money and matching that up with corporate and uh, foundation, other private funds, and then getting this, that funding out through various grant programs. We have somewhere between 65 and 70 different grant programs across the country. Um, I, know I see a lot of familiar faces from the Longleaf community, Longleaf Stewardship Fund. Many of y'all are familiar with that. This is a the Cumberland program is very modeled very similar to that, but has a little bit broader focus, um, not just um, not just short leaf. Over the past few years, we've really grown exponentially in terms of the amount of funding we've had available to get out through grants. Um, you know, part of that was due to the y'all may be familiar with the BP um, funding that uh, NIFWF manages through the Gulf Environmental Benefit Fund. That's huge. It was 2.5 billion dollars that came through that settlement, and that's. A totally separate program from what I deal with, but it's a, it's a large amount of funding, and that is uh, something that we manage very carefully with the states that were affected by that uh, unfortunate disaster. So, um, over the over the, our 30-year existence, we've put out more than 14,500 grants, and that keeps growing every year. We, we're doing hundreds of grants a year, um, and uh, we're increasing the number of partners, and it's been uh, really exciting to be a part of that. Just you can kind of see here a distribution of grants over the past uh, 30 years. And you can see the, there's a large cluster of projects up in the, the Chesapeake and along the coast in California and the um, Pacific Northwest, even down in the Gulf. And what I'd really like to see are some more points uh, in this area. I don't think that's working, but anyway, this area. So we're really looking to grow programs in the south. Um, over the next few years, we're, we've gone through a strategic planning process. We're, Actually, now our own team, we were lumped together with the entire East Coast, so uh, we have a new director, Jay Jensen, and we're really looking to ramp up fundraising and, and bring more dollars to conservation programs in the South. So getting into the actual program, the reason I'm here to, to talk with you all, um, the Cumberland Plateau Stewardship Fund uh, really started as a, through a partnership that we uh, entered into with International Paper a few years ago called Forest Land Stewards. That's the, the name of our partnership with them. Uh, 2013 was our first year making grants through that program. Uh, since then, we've added several additional partners uh, in RCS, working with Kevin Brown and with um, uh, Steve Musser and, and, and their teams at the, at the state NRCS level, uh, Alcoa Foundation, Altria Group, and we're, and we're hoping to add a few more partners over the next year or two to really increase the amount of funding that's available. 
And the focus of this program, it's uh, obviously the, the Cumberland Plateaus are really, um, bio, has tremendous biodiversity, so we're looking at uh, various conservation needs in this area, not just short leaf, but also freshwater habitat. There's a lot of endemic species, but really our goal is to help restore and improve those habitats. Uh, and you know, short leaf in this area is still um, gaining momentum. It doesn't have quite the foothold as it does out in Arkansas and Missouri, but uh, we're really looking to help um, help increase the awareness and also bring resources to bear to help uh, restore that ecosystem. Uh, and as the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, you know, we're really focused on improving habitat for fish and wildlife. So that's really our, our focus, but we do understand that there, there are economic factors that play into decisions that landowners make, and so we're very sensitive to that. And, and you know, looking really to tackle issues that can help um, address some of the barriers to actually getting um, these ecosystems restored. Um, as part of our partnership with International Paper, we, um, we developed a conservation business plan to help guide how we make, where we make grants and who, you know, where, uh, how we're investing those funds. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but that's, some, that's a model that we're trying to integrate into our programs, which really helps us define um, not just a geography, but also specific uh, priorities and conservation strategies within um, those areas. And, and really, we're also trying to mesh together and integrate all the different um, interests and priorities of the partners, which is a challenge, but it's also um, what makes this job very interesting is uh, trying to, to meet the multiple needs and interests. So this is what we've defined as a Cumberland Plateau, that gr the gray outline area, and that was based off of EPA ecoregions, which it's a little bit broader than what I think you'd probably consider the, the Cumberland Plateau, and it also includes the interior plateau and portion of the western Allegheny um, up. So really from the West Virginia line down through East Kentucky along the Daniel Boone National Forest and then kind of going through um, East Central Tennessee and, and then into Northern Alabama. So it covers, you know, just a small portion of the whole uh, short leaf range, but there's also, you know, key watersheds and other uh, features that we were looking at when we were developing this, this uh, program. And just, so it's in addition to defining the larger geography, we really wanted to hone in on some focal areas where we could make strategic investments that will hopefully provide the most conservation bang for the buck. And just to give you an idea of what these, these ovals and circles actually are encompassing, um, you know, they vary based on the, cons the, the resource needs, so the, the blue being freshwater priorities, um, and I'm red green colorblind so I may get the colors wrong <laughs> I made this map I'm so embarrassed to say this but I think it's orange or maybe it's green the three um, ovals in the middle there freshwater and terrestrial and then the, the dark red down there around Chattanooga um, being just terrestrial and so Green River watershed the elk and the duck both have significant um, freshwater conservation uh, you know a lot of endemic species uh, fish freshwater mussels uh, down around the Bankhead National Forest, Upper Sipsi Fork, and then you know up in the area where we were yesterday, the Catoosa Daniel Boone National Forest, uh, as well as the Upper Cumberland, South Fork of the Cumber Cumberland River, and some other key watersheds. Uh, Bridgestone, Firestone, w WMA, uh, you know these are areas where they have some existing short leaf and where we feel like there's great potential to kind of build off of these core protected or publicly owned lands to um, to you know to, to uh, increase this uh, or I guess restore this ecosystem. And, uh, and then lastly, down around the uh, Prentice Cooper State Forest, uh, Lookout Mountain, and that area around uh, Chattanooga, north, very tiny portion of uh, northwest Georgia. So what are the program objectives? Um, as part of the business planning process, we identified some specific goals that we were hoping to achieve, some on-the-ground outcomes associated with the, the grants and the investments we'd be making. Um, and so these are some, some acreage targets that we had for specifically for short leaf, uh, seeking to restore or really establish uh, at least 3,500 acres of short leaf pine, uh, improve or enhance 50,000 acres of existing. And that's largely through you know the use of prescribed fire, but also um, other other types of management. Um, and then there is the, the water component, so restoring riparian forest. Um, we did there was an interest in. Uh, helping to protect some working land, so working forests. So we've integrated in conservation easements and some funding to help cover transaction costs uh, with easements. Uh, and then you know, my, the streams, you know, a thousand miles of stream and associated stream habitat. And I'll talk a little bit more about the specific strategies that we're, um, we're funding through the, to help achieve these uh, goals. 
And then this is all for us really wildlife driven. So we, um, we wanted to identify some, some species that we felt like would be good indicators of uh, success in terms of getting habitat into a, a, a high quality condition. And so um, it was a little tricky in the Cumberland, especially for the freshwater, because there's so many endemics. But um, you know, bobwhite quail, prairie warbler, um, being you know, grassland species and really you know, with short leaf, I think we're, you know, there's, um, we're looking at you know, both the savanna system as well as uh, really just in, overall getting short leaf on, in the ground. So um, these we felt like were broad enough to cover the entire range and we could hopefully see some actual uh, benefit in the, in the short time window that we have uh, for this initial partnership with IP, which I've, I failed to mention is a five year partnership, $7.5 million. Um, we hope to expand that and carry it forward into the future and, and actually in, and grow that partnership. But uh, our goals were set in a five-year window. So those acreage goals, that's from 2013 to 2017. That's what we're shooting for. Uh, and then the realization that so much of the land in this area is you know, owned by private landowners, so they're going to be an important partner in this. So really uh, involving them in, in the restoration work that y'all are doing. Uh, so we're trying to reach at least a thousand private landers and we've actually already exceeded some of these goals to date So we'll be revisiting our, uh, our conservation plan So kind of getting more into the nuts and bolts of the grant program itself um, I mean you can see the map and, and the areas that are eligible for funding, but it includes portions of Alabama, Georgia, Kentucky and Tennessee um, In terms of lands that would be eligible to actually receive the funding and have it go into the ground uh, privately owned lands state local government owned lands um, because we have some federal funding, uh, we have to, to balance you know, investments that go on federal lands, but they can be part of um, projects that have a broader suite of, of, of properties. Um, eligible applicants include nonprofits, uh, state, local, tribal governments. Uh, we have an active grant now with, with Wayne Clatterbuck here, um, so academic institutions. Uh, so federal agencies can't apply directly, but you can be partners with others on applications. We actually encourage that partnerships, not just on you know, our side with funding and, and growing the program, but also on the project side. We really want strong partnerships and uh, you know, bringing together and leveraging the expertise and resources of different entities. Uh, in terms of funding availability, grants typically range between fifty and two hundred thousand dollars, and just kind of. Um, depends on the, the amount of funding we have available and then on the scale of the project. Um, the past couple years we've been able to award around $700,000, $750,000 total in grants and um, we're looking at probably a similar funding availability this next cycle. Um, we do have a one-to-one -one match requirement for all grants and it's, uh, it's a non-federal uh, match requirement so it can be cash or in-kind services and that can include a a lot of different things, staff time, uh, it can even include the value of land if, if, you're, uh, if you've recently acquired a piece of, of land and want to do some restoration on that property. And projects typically last about two years, so from the time you actually get the, the grant award to the time that you're wrapping up the project, it's usually two, two and a half years. And uh, we are looking to hopefully see some significant on the ground deliverables within the first year that we can uh, report out to our partners. In terms of priorities, and I'll go into more depth uh, on these, but um, you know, really, as I mentioned, restoring and enhancing short leaf are the, are the ones I'll talk about the most, since that's you know that's why we're here. Uh, but we also um, are interested in restoring riparian forests and, and really increasing the capacity of, team, of of entities and teams working in this region to to work with private landowners to uh, to get more fire on the ground, um, things like that. And then also the, there's the conservation easement and land conservation component. So um, restoring short leaf, I mean, what we mean by, you know, in terms of that term restore for us, it really means establishment. And maybe we should just say establishment, but putting trees in the ground um, so we can fund the actual cost of purchasing seedlings, materials, labor, um, site prep, all those things are eligible for funding under this program. Um, because of the scale of the funding and really just, especially in this region, you know, we're still trying to um, build awareness of uh, this effort, you know, we're really focusing on cr establishing good demonstration sites that can be examples for other landowners, whether it be other agencies or other or private landowners. Um, not that that's exclusively what's el eligible, but that was a priority that we identified in the in the conservation planning process. 
And then for where there are existing stands of short leaf, you know, managing and making sure that those, those stands are being um, managed appropriately and prescribed fire and, and really building that capacity, it sounds like in this area, you know, there's, um, whereas in long leaf, I think they're a little bit um, farther along in terms of developing capacity for fire, but possibly, you know, funding burn teams to, it could be interagency, could be, um, could be contractors, but, you know, really uh, developing that expertise and the capacity to go out and help uh, landowners burn. Um, and then, you know, are there specific barriers to getting more fire on the ground? Uh, we, we try to, you know, be strategic with our funding and address those roadblocks that may be there that are, are limiting getting fire on the ground. And so we're interested in innovative projects that can help do that. And other types of uh, restoration and management um, activities are eligible to thinning, invasive control, mechanical, chemical treatments, and things like that. So um, we're, we're uh, you know, looking for multiple um, activities usually in a grant, and, and, if, and it's not that, you can, you know, you can apply for a variety of, of different um, strategies. I'm not really going to focus on the, the, the freshwater side of things. Um, I'll be glad to talk with you more about it individually if you want, but um, since this isn't, you know, we're talking about short leaf, I didn't want to dwell on this really. And getting back to the technical assistance and outreach, so increasing boots on the ground, you know, uh, getting folks out there working with private landowners. And there's several current grant uh, recipients here today. You've know, got Wayne Clatterbuck, uh, Chris Irwin, um, Ken Adams is here. So they're all current uh, grant recipients and, and working right now. And they can, they can kind of give you the, the behind the scoop, you know, and how it is working with NIFWF and, you know, is it, is it worth your time to apply for the Cumberland Plateau Stewardship Fund? And just, you know, what, what is that funding uh, enabling them to do? So they can give you more on the nuts and bolts of their projects. But um, one, and one of the other things, and I, something that I, you know, on the field trip yesterday was interesting to hear about is, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like there's really no pine mills or markets right here in Tennessee. So that, you know, could be a real challenge to getting landowners to plant more pine. And so, um, what are some other market-based or type of incentives that could be available? You know, it sounds like um, there's, you know, a, a lot of folks are interested in the kind of the heritage aspect of it or just, you know, ma managing their forest for uh, wildlife. And so um, what are different ways to, to engage or interest landowners in short leaf restoration? Um, and, you know, we do, uh, we work pretty closely within RCS, obviously. So um, looking at how we can leverage existing cost share programs, equip other programs that might be available for private landowners. And then with, um, with International Paper being one of our, really our key partners, they're really interested in third, I should say third party, not third part certification, but um, getting private landowners in, enrolled in, in those programs, they're really interested in um, seeing, you know, the a, a fiber supply out there that, that's certified, even though they're not, um, is, don't have quite the presence that they did uh, in the past in this region, but uh, it is a priority for them, and, and so we've inc included that in the program. And as I mentioned with conservation easements, um, because of the scale of funding we have, we're really focusing on the transaction costs mainly, uh, but if there's a strategic project that you're working on, and it could be a fee simple acquisition, it doesn't have to be a conservation easement, um, we'd love to talk with you about that because we do have an acreage goal for that. Um, but primarily, we're, we're, you know, we're funding things like appraisals or surveys, um, environmental assessments, things like that, or staff time actually to go out and work with private landowners that may be interested uh, in a conservation easement on their property. And just to date, um, you know, where we are in terms of grant making. So this is, we just finished our third year of grant making, uh, announced projects back in June, July. Um, 14 projects have received grants in all four of the states that we're, that we're covering uh, for one, more than $1.7 million in actual grants going out the door. And those projects are gonna lever, it's really good return on investment, $4 million are gonna be uh, coming in from the grantees through cash and in-kind and, and you know, the partnerships they've developed. And as you may remember, we had set a goal for 3,500 acres being established. We're, with these projects, we're going to exceed that after three years. So we're going to have to go back and um, evaluate. Uh, we need to increase that, that goal. So we'll be uh, working on adjusting that over the next um, year. Uh, and we've almost hit the goal for acres in, improved or enhanced. We're, you know, we're almost at that 50,000 acre goal, so that's great. Uh, and then this last cycle was the first one where we included land conservation as a priority, and we've already uh, been able to um, 
bring in a couple projects that are going to address that. So we're really excited about integrating that into the, the program and, and getting some, um, some land conserved, where the, um, especially where there's going to be doing you know, some restoration work taking place. Uh, and then the private landowner outreach and engagement, um, you know, a, a large bulk of this, I have to admit, is the work that American Forest Foundation is doing. And if you haven't talked with Chris Irwin about the multiple messaging and, and uh, targeted marketing campaign work that they're doing in North Alabama, they're also doing it in other parts of the U.S. It's really uh, an interesting project to looking at what, um, you know, what factors drive landowners to actually do restoration and, and forest management and how do you... Um, how do you hit those interest points? So looking at consumer data to, to help inform uh, outreach. And then we are, you know, encourage, we want folks to, to be utilizing the cost share programs that are available. So um, enrolling in, in RCS programs, farm bill programs, um, other, other programs, working lands for wildlife, things like that. So um, taking advantage, fully taking advantage of those cost share programs and making sure that landowners are aware of what resources are available. And wanted to highlight a couple of the pro ongoing projects that are, that are active. Um, and I think Brant is still here with Turkey Federation. He can talk with you about this project. But this is one we uh, funded in 2014, um, focused on you know, doing some restoration and, and management on the Daniel Boone for short leaf, as well as the North Cumberland WMA. Uh, and you can kind of see these are kind of the components that make up really the deliverables, I guess you could say, that make up the grant. So doing some planting, and then a lot of it is doing um, uh, really improving habitat or imp uh, where there's some existing short leaf uh, and they've you know identified some specific species they hope to to benefit and then you know these areas will serve as demonstration sites so bringing landowners out there to see you know hey here's what we're doing this is how you know what you could be doing on your land and, and here's some um, some ways that maybe we can help you with that Uh, another project, this is one that uh, Kent Adams and, and Quail Forever, Pheasants Forever, is working on. Um, they're actually putting a farm bill biologist in, in RCS office to help um, with the technical assist assistance side, so getting boots on the ground to actually work with private landowners to get them, uh, make them aware of the, the cost share programs that are av available for short leaf and also riparian buffers. Uh, and so, you know, you can see kind of the, um, the, the scale of the grant and the kind of outcomes that they're able to achieve with this type of investment. And I'm not going to go through all these, but just um, proposal tips and kind of what we're looking for in, a, in an application. I think number one is really important. On the ground outcomes um, are key, and that's really what our partners want to see: is uh, you know acreage being established, acreage being improved, um, and you know these. As I mentioned, these could be multi-layer projects that have um, kind of a research component or a um, you know some pilot effort, some type of pilot project, but they do need to be. Um, actually achieving some on-the-ground outcomes. Uh, what, I mean, and the one I really wanted to continue to highlight is just partnerships. Um, we really, you know, it's important to bring together partners and to bring together that expertise and the various resources and I just want to make sure that I highlight that um, if you're thinking about applying for this next cycle. And I'm not going to read these off to you, but um, we do have, uh, we will be, uh, well, I'll go ahead and move down to the, um, the timeline. So the next RFP is going to come out in November. This is for the 2016 funding cycle. Uh, we will have a webinar, so all those detailed bullet points and kind of the how do you, you know, structure a competitive proposal, we'll go through that in more detail if you're interested in it. Um, and if you, you know, you want to be made aware of when the webinar is going to take place, please email me and I'll make sure to add you to the list so that you know, you know when that's going to take place. Uh, and so that'll probably, you know, that we'll, we'll post the RFP in November on our website and, and we'll send that out via email. Uh, we'll have the webinar sometime in early January after the holidays with the full proposals due in February. And then we have a, a review process that we bring together our, our partners and, and um, do a technical review of the, all, all the applications and we um, hope always shoot to make award announcements in June. And so, um, and, and one of the things about NIFWIF is we really encourage folks to contact us if you're thinking about applying. We want to want to hear your ideas. We want to um, be able to provide some feedback. We're really open to that and think it's important. Uh, it's a, you know, 
I'll be the first to admit I was an applicant to NIFA before an employee, <laughs> and so I know the challenges of working with easy grants, and uh, it's not so easy, and you know just the the various components of those grants, and a lot of that is due to the you know the nature of the funding and just the the magnitude of projects that are grants that we receive. But you know want to make sure that um, you know we can give you some some feedback and and help provide some guidance along the way. So. Um, anyway, that's what I wanted to talk about, all I had for today. This is my contact information. I'll be around for the rest of the day if you have any questions, want to talk about project ideas, and, but feel free to call me, send me an email, you know, try to be accessible. So, any questions? <laughs>